Father, we sense your anointing. We sense your presence. Father, I pray that you would blanket this room with a peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray for a calming anointing to just fall right now in this room. Confusion has to go. Frustration has to go. Stress has to go. And I speak peace in this room right now in Jesus' name. Thank you all so much for being here. Such a beautiful congregation. As Pastor Mike said earlier, uh, send you greetings from pastors. They are in Honduras, but we are so happy to have Brittany and Brian with us for a few hours. Amen. So good to have them back, and we are believing, as Pastor Mike said, that they will be home for good in just a few moments. Not a few days, not a few weeks, in a few moments. In Jesus' name, we are believing for it. This is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is always a special day because this is the day when we, when we recognize what was done for us. This is that holy week. Over the next seven days, over 2,000 years ago, the world was turned upside down forever. And it changed forever because our Savior chose to get up on a young colt and ride towards the city of Jerusalem and lay his life down, not just for the people of that time, but for us, for all eternity. And when I tell you that is such a sobering thought, I don't know about you, but it always, it always quickens me to know that my Savior, if I was the only person left on this earth, he would have did it again just for me. That's a sobering reminder. So today as we celebrate Palm Sunday, I want to talk to you guys about this different day. We're in this different, it's a different day series. And I really believe the Lord has a strong word today. It is, it is not a, this won't be a, uh, a jumping and jiving and a hucking and bucking word, I can promise you. The first service, I got a little bit of cringing, I heard. So hopefully there'll be a little bit of cringing in this service as well. But it's reality. His word is reality, amen? amen? There's no sugarcoating in his word. And so I hope not to be able to sugarcoat it for you today. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Exodus 32. I'm going to go old school today. I know we've been, pastors have been asking you guys to bring your word, bring your Bible with you. If you don't have your Bible, that's fine. Hopefully you have your smartphone or your iPad. Go ahead and open up to Exodus 32, and let's get started. And it says in Exodus 32, 1, 1 and 6, it says, When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. Somebody say, danger. danger. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced... Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. The people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. And after this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. Danger. Can anybody see the warning signs? Danger. Danger. We've gone completely away from the Lord is our God to this, this golden image is now our God. But let me ask you guys a question. Does this look any different from what we see today? We may not have a golden calf, 
that we worship, but we sure can worship our cars and our homes and the people in office. We sure can put those people up on a pedestal like a God and totally forsake who God is in our life. You see, a lot of us, we put our false hope in a person or an idea, just as the children of Israel put their false hope in Aaron. You see, a lot of us settle for Aaron when we really need Moses. Aaron is not who, who was supposed to be in charge. The children of Israel, Israel heard God tell the people of Israel, Moses is the one who will lead you. But when Moses disappeared, while he was spending time with the Lord, the people of Israel grew restless. And you see, today's society has grown restless because we've been hearing for years, oh, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back, and he hasn't come back yet, so we start trying to find an Aaron. And we're busy looking for Aaron, and we miss out on the Moses he's placed in our lives. You see, we're looking for answers from everywhere but from the right place. And we violate the blessing by cursing it. The Bible says that every good gift comes from the Father above. And when, the, and when the gifts are given to us, when the blessing is given to us, we tend to look at the blessing instead of the blessor. And when the blessor puts the blessing in our hand, we tend to idolize it. And because we've turned it into an idol, the Bible says that it's cursed. So the very blessing that the Lord gave you, you are now walking under a curse with that blessing because you've chosen to put that on a pedestal. You see, the gold rings that they gave, you know, that they gave Aaron to turn into that molten image the Bible says at the beginning of Exodus that when they left Egypt, when Egypt decided to let them go, the Bible says that the children of Israel plundered the people of Egypt for the 400 years of slavery that they worked for free. So that was their payment. So the blessing that the Lord gave them, they turned right around and used that blessing against their own purpose, against their own destiny. What do you have right now that the Lord has blessed you with that you've turned into an idol? What have you allowed to dictate your life that was supposed to be a blessing? Instead, it's become an idol. It's become a curse in your life. Yeah. Wow. I told you this message wouldn't be cushy. See, we love to quote this verse. We love to quote Acts 2.17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. We can all quote that. But I can tell you right now, God's not going to pour his spirit out in it in a dirty vessel. Okay. If you're not living right, if you're not living the way he's called you to live, he's not pouring out his spirit in that. Yeah. We are called to be set apart people. Yeah. The Bible says to be holy for I am holy, the Bible, God says to us. Being holy means to set yourself apart. So it's important for us to understand that. But I've got good news for you. It is a different day, but revival is coming. Revival is coming. We will see truly his spirit poured out in these last days. That's, ne that's, that's not just something written just to be written. It's something that will happen. It's something that is already happening all across this planet. In different pockets around the world, we are starting to see an, a, a crazy outpouring of his spirit like never before. But my question is to you, is it happening here in America? Can we honestly say it's happening here? because it didn't happen for the children of Israel until some things change. And I want to show you. Go ahead and turn over to Exodus 33. We'll get into the bulk of this. I hope you're taking notes. Exodus 33 says, The Lord said to Moses, Get going, you and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt. Go up to the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them, I will give this land to your descendants. You see, even when they made a mistake, even when they disgraced the name of their Lord, even though he had just rescued them and parted the Red Sea and rescued them from a terrible enemy, and even though they went and betrayed him, his word was still fulfilled. His word was still established. And I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to this land that flows with milk and honey. His word will always be fulfilled in your life, no matter what. 
no matter what. The word must still come to pass. A lot of people wonder, you know, in these times that we live in, where is God in all of this? He's right where he needs to be, on his throne. He hadn't forgotten you. He hadn't forgotten us. A lot of people wonder, especially with, you know, what's going on in the political realm, you know, the, the, the just upheaval, the uproar that we're facing. God is still in charge. He is still on the throne. And no matter who's in office, no matter who, you know, who does what, who does what, what, where, he is still in charge. He is still on the throne. He will still take care of us the way he said he would because he said he would. And you can take that to the bank. Moving on. Exodus 33, 4 and 6 says, When the people heard these stern words, they went into mourning and stopped wearing their jewelry and fine clothes. For the Lord had told Moses to tell them, You are a stubborn and rebellious people. You are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I were to travel with you for even a moment, I would destroy you. I'm, you know, most people say, oh, but that's not the God we serve. He's a loving God. And, oh, he just excuses me for how I want to live my life. It doesn't work that way. I'm sorry to tell you it doesn't work that way. You are a stubborn and rebellious people, and if I were to travel with you for even a moment, I would destroy you. Remove your jewelry and fine clothes while I decide to do, to do with you. So from the time they left Mount Sinai, the Israelites wore no more jewelry or fine clothes. Repentance and removal are required. You can't have revival without repentance. You can't have revival without a removal of yourself out of areas and out of bondages that you face your whole life. You see, a lot of people think revival is all about the worship and the praise and the shouting and the hucking and the bucking. That's not revival. Revival is putting on burlap, throwing ashes on your head and saying, oh, Lord, I have sinned greatly against you. Please forgive me. Please wash me clean. Please remove the junk out of my life that is separating me from you. That's revival. And when we get to that point, that's when he can pour out his spirit on us as he promised us. You see, true change only comes after a true shift towards repentance. If your heart isn't right, what you do outside is of little importance. And as I said in the first service, you can dress it up, you can clean it, make sure you take a bath, put on perfume or cologne, you can put on your nice Sunday, go to meeting clothes. But if the, out, but if the inside is dirty, little what you do on the outside means jack diddly squat. The inside is what he needs to have cleaned. The inside is, must be cleaned. Losing out on the presence of God should cause a shift in your thinking about the trivial things of life. Amen. Moving on. Exodus 33, 7 says, It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting and set it up some distance from the camp. Everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Proactive separation welcomes renewed fellowship. You have to get to the point in your life when enough is enough. Enough of being with the crowd, enough of doing what your friends are doing, enough of doing what the status quo is, and you need to pick up your tent and get outside of the camp sometimes and get alone with God. You can't continue to live the life that you're living and want to try to do better but still try to mingle with the people that's living, living in sin and doing the things that you know you ain't supposed to be doing, but you're doing it anyways. Moses had to pick himself up, get outside of the camp so he can talk to God. And until we get to that place, until we understand, until we embrace, we got to be separate. We have to be set apart. We will continue to face, the, face some of the troubles and the trials that we go through. You see, the children of Israel lapped around the same mountain for 40 years because they decided they want to stay inside the same mindset. You see, sometimes the camp is not a physical camp. It's a, it's a mental camp. And if in your mind you are still subjected to the way you used to do life, you will continue to lap the same mountains over and over again until you realize, until you comprehend, until you embrace. Mentally, I got to check out of here. Mentally, I need to pick myself up and get out of where I am so I can embrace what God is doing in my life. Where you set up your tent determines your desire for him. If you're so worried about what other people are thinking, if you're so worried about what your friends may say, 
then you really don't desire him. Just as pastors always say, what somebody else thinks about you is none of your business. And if you get up and leave, you know you're doing the right thing because the Bible tells you to be set apart, to be holy. Moving on. Exodus 33, 8 and 11 says, Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand in the entrances of their own tents. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. As he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at his entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Leaders must lead. And not, it wasn't until Moses took, the, took it upon himself to separate himself was when the people reacted. When the people, when the people saw him get up from where he was and go to where the Lord was, the people then in turn got on their knees and said, oh, Lord, we need you just as much as Moses does. And when the people can get behind their leader and push him up in worship and push him up in praise, then that leader can be connected to the Lord of the universe. And then he can come back and, and deliver the word that is necessary. Imagine if the leaders around this, around just, just, just in this country, led the way they were supposed to lead. Imagine if us as pastors, we locked arms with pastors in California and in Vermont and in Washington and in Georgia. If we locked arms instead of being so disunified and said, let's get together and go out to the camp. Let's go out to the tent of meeting together so that we can win this nation back for Christ. What, what, what could we really see change about America? Because once America changes, the rest of the world changes. See, the closer the leaders get to God, the people follow suit. And the next generation of leaders are groomed when leaders take their place. You read a little bit further down um, in that verse, it says, Joshua, Moses' assistant, went with him to the tabernacle daily. But anytime Moses would get up to leave and go back to the people to deliver the word, the Bible says Joshua would stay in the tabernacle. Imagine if our Moseses would raise up more Joshuas. Because it wasn't Moses who led them into the promised land. It was Joshua who led them into the promised land. And when Joshua led them into the, into the promised land, it was because he spent so much time in the Lord's presence. That's how revival comes. That's how revival is sustained. Because the children of Israel experienced revival, but they didn't stay there. But it wasn't until Joshua realized that he needed to stay in the presence of the Lord so that they can continue to walk in revival. And we can walk in revival if we raise up the next generation. These young kids over the past two days have been in a conference experiencing what Joshua experienced. They stayed in the tabernacle. And because of it, they'll be the generation that'll take this nation forward and carry us and continue us into revival. Amen? Exodus 33, 12 and 13 says, One day Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me, I know you by name, and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. You see, after you spent your time with the Lord and you repent and then you start to lead the way he's called you to lead, then boldness comes. Your proper posture in his presence gives way to boldness. But we can't be bold with God if we're first not having a repentant heart. We can't approach the throne with sin, with baggage. We have to confess and repent of those things, and then we can approach the throne with boldness and say, Lord, okay, you said if I do this and I repeat what you said you, that you told me, you said you were going to do that. So where are you at? And that's what Moses said. We can walk in that boldness. We can walk in that boldness in this country. We can walk in boldness in this city and take this place back and declare that revival is here. Revival is coming because we can approach the throne of grace with boldness and declare that, Lord, you said this, and so I'm counting on you to do what you said you would do. You said if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. Imagine if we would just humble ourselves. If we, so, if we are the people that, who are so called by his name, why aren't we humbled yet? Why aren't we walking in humility? 
Because if we were truly walking in humility, Chattanooga wouldn't be the way it is today. You can't advance towards revival without the power of his presence. Desiring to know him is priority number one. He must be your first desire. He must be the reason why you wake up in the morning. He must be the reason why you go to work. He must be the reason why you love your kids. He must be the reason why you love your wife. He must be the reason why you come to church. Church is not a social club. Now, it's great to build relationships and build community, but that's, when this, that, that's not the ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose is to point you to the Savior. And the Savior allows you to have the relationships. The Savior allows you to build community. The Savior allows you to walk out of here changed and in your right mind. It's the Savior, not us, not you. It's him. He's your first priority. Exodus 33, 14 through 17 says, The Lord replied, I will personally go with you. That should encourage somebody today. Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. That should be your prayer. You shouldn't take another step without his presence. When you wake up and your feet hit the floor, you should be asking the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to on my job? How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. God always responds to your faith. He always responds to your faith, always, without fail, will respond to your faith. God won't move on your behalf if you never ask. If you don't ever ask, if you never, if you never ask him for anything, then you have nobody to blame but yourself for wanting to see change happen in your life. For you to want to see revival, you have to ask for it. God always confirms your prayer with a promise. He doesn't confirm Adam's prayer with my promise, he confirms Adam's prayer with his promise for him. That's why you need to personally pray. You need to personally seek God's will for your life. And the more you do that, the more you ask him, not only will he respond to that prayer, he will promise you that he will be with you everywhere you go. Amen? So in this different day, we can truly see revival. Do you believe that? Do you believe that we can truly see Revival. Do you truly believe that he can really pour out his spirit on all flesh and we can really see a move of God? Do you believe that? You see, what happened almost 2,000 years ago on the first Palm Sunday, that was the first revival of the new church, of the new covenant. Because that nation at that time looked a lot like how we look right now. People doing whatever they want to do, sleeping with whoever they want to sleep with, thinking and doing things that are not holy, not righteous, not, not following who God's word says them and call them to be. That's exactly what Jesus faced. As a matter of fact, in Luke 19, right after they laid the palm branches down and they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Bible says right after that, when he looked at Jerusalem, he wept. He bawled his eyes out. You know why he bawled it? You know why he was crying so hard? Because he knew that these people would reject him. He knew that these people would turn and and, and not see him for who he really was, which was their savior, which was their hope, which was their deliverer. They were so content to keep living the way they were living that they missed their salvation standing right in front of them. So my question is to you today, if Jesus was here today, do you think he would weep over us as America? Do you think he would weep over us as a society? I do. You see, we can, like Moses, ask God, Show me your glory. Show it to me. I want to see your glory. When we ask in faith, we get more than what we ask for. Every time. When we ask in faith, the Bible says in Mark chapter 12, if we ask and do not doubt in our heart, we will receive that which we ask for. And then it also says in Ephesians 3.20, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So if we're asking for revival, if we're believing for revival, if we're believing for change, 
that means he's going to go above and beyond that because he's above and beyond God. Amen? So we will be able to see his goodness. We will be able to hear him speak his name over us. We'll be able to feel the very warmth of his hand on our face and hide us in the shelter of the rock. And we will, we, and we will get to feel the aftershocks but not be consumed by it. You know, so many people talk about, oh, I experienced the glory of God. Oh, it's just so strong in me right now. But yet they're still standing upright. If you study scripture, when the glory really fell on somebody, they were never standing. They were almost to the point of death because the glory was so strong. But even as bad as that sounds, man, I would love to experience it. I would love to experience that true revival. I would love to experience that powerful move so strongly that it knocks me off my feet. You know, in the garden, when they came to arrest Jesus, and they said, and they said, are you that man? And he turns to them and says, I am. The Bible says that every single person that, that heard him speak fell backwards. I believe that was the glory. I believe that was the glory. And see, the glory functions in a lot of different ways. To me, when he said, I am, the glory functioned as conviction at that point. Some of you under the sound of my voice are sensing that conviction now. That you need revival. The very word revival, the very word revive is to mean to bring something back up that was dead and bring it back to life. But not just the life that it was, but better life. But in order for you to experience that, you have to admit that, hey, I need revival. So we get to see his goodness. We get to hear him speak his name over us. We get to feel his hand and, and be hidden. And we get to feel the aftershocks but not be consumed by it. It's a different day, folks. But revival is coming. I hope you can hang on to that. I hope you haven't given up hope. I hope you, didn't, you, know, I hope you don't think that this world is going to hell in a handbasket like everybody likes to say. Because it really isn't. Because he is still in charge. He is still on the throne. And the same way he delivered the children of Israel, even after they made a boneheaded mistake, and even when we make boneheaded mistakes in this country all the time, he still has a promise to fulfill because it will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Did that help anybody today? I want to pray with you guys. And right after that, um, if, if, if you guys don't mind, just stay seated. You should have got a communion element um, when you came in the building. So Mike is going to come back and do that with you guys. So I want to pray with you guys real fast and um, just see what God wants to do in these last moments in the service. Father, we thank you that revival is coming, that we will see your salvation. We will see the very glory, the very presence that you promised us, Father. And we know that you have already gone before us and you have already laid the map out. You have already laid the track out, Father God, by your word to bring us into the promise. So, Father, help us to have a repentant heart. Help us to remove those things that would separate us from you and truly, truly grasp the concept that revival is here. Revival is here in Jesus' name. We trust your word, and we trust you to do what you said you would do, and we give you the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.